Good evening. Uh, I am Reverend Tom Leach. Um, I am not a doctor, nor have I ever portrayed one on television. But about a couple of years ago, a couple of friends of ours who, who have also had NDEs, we started putting NDE behind our name because we felt that was a life lesson in and of itself. So my near-death experience, my most recent near-death experience was a little over nine years ago. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my adventures into what I call a humanist, complete humanist. So I'm going to talk about the day I died, which was February 27th, 2008. And then we're going to talk a little bit about my life afterwards, the after effects of my NDE and the integration process, which continues and continues and continues. Um, I'm going to give you some definitions. Uh, for me, complete humanness is to be fully immersed in the duality of life, positive and negative, good and bad, passionate and indifferent, often at the same time. That's my version of the human condition. Now, I also use the cosmic 2 by 4 as my definition. Uh, other words that you might use are serendipity or coincidence, um, which I don't believe exists. Um, but it's spirit's way of getting your attention what were you thinking moments, giving you a little bit of a course direction. Sometimes they could be a little nudge on the back, or a gentle caress on the back of the head, or in my case, being Irish, Roman Catholic, and a Capricorn, it is more often a large swing with the entire two by four. The last one, or this one that we're gonna talk about, sent me home. Um, yeah, that's, that's all that, okay. So, we'll start with my early years. I was a cute little baby. Yeah. Now I've often wondered what happened. Okay, I was born December the 30th of 1960. In 26 more hours, I would not have been a tax deduction for said year, something my father was extremely proud of. The president was Dwight David Eisenhower. The president-elect, John F. Kennedy. The world was experiencing some great change. The old ways of thinking we're slowly moving out of the way to new ways of thinking. It was a clash between the flat tops that I remember as a kid, and yes, I did have one, um, which is hard for all of you to believe because, yes, I did have hair at one time. Um, the economical, political, and social issues were transforming the globe. We look back on it in history, this was part of my life. We had the, the ideological thought or fight between the United States of America and the dreaded Russian Empire. We were playing this game out in Cuba and Southeast Asia and in China. By the time I was 10, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War, the protest to end that war, and my brother went there twice, which does not bode well for my sanity. The civil rights movement had begun and was coming to a boiling point. The president and his brother were killed, as well as Martin Luther King. We had landed on the moon and we had Woodstock by the time I was 10 years old. Change was certainly in the air and it just wasn't in my diaper. I was born into a family that included a loving mother, a hardworking father, two older brothers, one who was 12 years older than I am, one who was seven years older than I was. There was a little bit of resentment going on. I was the child that everybody dropped the other two to go take care of me. And, and I know we've seen that played out in hundreds of families. We were not close. I learned how to defend myself physically and mentally from all the onslaught of that anger and that resentment. I learned how to hit a baseball because my brothers would throw the ball at my head and I had to hit it to survive. So that was always fun. Um, yeah, understanding the siblings can be cruel to each other. Yeah, my brothers took that to a new level. Um, one of which I have not spoken to in over 25 years, and the other one in over 10 years. My dad was a perfectionist, and he was not readily available. No matter how hard I tried, I just wasn't good enough. And it was repeatedly told me that I was not good enough. I later spent the rest of my life proving them right. 
I often heard big boys don't cry. Up until the age of five, I saw my guardian angel. I made the mistake of telling my brother. Now, I know she's still there, but I never saw her again. At least that I know of. Uh, I became withdrawn, had difficulty making friends in my neighborhood. I had difficulty making friends uh, with myself. My mom was warm, loving, caring, encouraging, and she made the most incredible cakes. Yeah, I just get warm thinking about them. One day she was busy in the kitchen making a, 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 a cake or two. My dad was upstairs sleeping, my brothers were playing in the basement. My mom didn't want to be interrupted. So she asked me to go downstairs and play with my brothers. They did not want to be bothered with me. So I ended up sitting at the top of the stairs and my dog came up and started licking my face and I, I never forgot that. That was the most unconditional love I've ever experienced other than my mother's until I died. I went to a Roman Catholic elementary school. We do guilt very well. I'm happy to report I am recovering Catholic. Um, and, and that is an ongoing process. I was plagued with feelings of not fitting in, not being smart enough, not finding relief within any environment that I was in. I did learn discipline and punishment and increasingly higher expectations because I went to a Roman Catholic school. I learned that when I die, I will go to the pearly gates and be judged. And based on what I felt of my life, my prospects were not very good. My family forgot my eighth birthday. Oh my gosh, how loving. Now, I, I can tell you a story about that day, but the reason I use a PowerPoint is so that I don't go off on tangents like that. But it was an interesting story about that day. No, oh, you can do it. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> In the summer of 1969, I was flying a kite from the back porch. Now, our back porch sat up fairly high on cement pillars. It was a row home. I think around here they might call them townhouses. Um, my kite got stuck in a tree underneath the porch, and I wanted it back. So I kept pulling on the string and kept leaning over, and eventually I was passing my kite on my way to the ground. I hit my left leg and I hit my head. My left ankle was broken. Some say my head is too. But I don't remember anything other than a little bit of screaming when everybody realized what had happened. And then when I got home, I remember my mom stroking my hair and I was tucked in my own bed. And I had a cast on my leg. I do remember a light. But it was all encompassing. It was all I saw. Now, being eight years old and as handsome as I am, I can only tell you that after that experience, I was a different kid. That's how different. I experienced thoughts and feelings that I didn't understand along with severe depression that was cyclical. I was for searching for something that I couldn't understand, so what did I do? I ate my mother's cakes, and a lot of them. In the fifth grade, I was introduced to science fiction. Actually, it was a book by um, Robert Silverberg called Across a Billion Years. I still have that book to this day. And the reason for that is it, that book I learned about other worlds, other thoughts, the possibility that there was a civilization a billion years old. This opened my mind to thoughts that started fitting in. In the summer of 72, I went to the summer playground learned how to play soccer, and I did that for the next 25 years until <laughs> my legs wouldn't work anymore. High school is the perfect combination of hormones, peer pressure, and pimples. And quite frankly, I had them all. 
not the best place for my fragile ego, my oversized body, and my growing dissatisfaction with myself. In my Roman Catholic family, I was destined to become a priest until the 10th grade. And a girl kissed me, and that was the end of that. <laughs> After that, I was either looking for or being in love. And I look back on that experience in the light and what I felt afterwards, and it was that experience of love that I was chasing after. I was often told, don't things, take things too personally, and it's really hard to do. Because I was feeling those emotions. And, we, and um, our previous speaker talked about how you have those heightened emotions after an NDE. Heightened feelings, heightened senses. I could read people like a book until I realized people didn't like being read like a book. <laughs> so I shut down that. On graduation day, my father told me he was proud of me and that he loved me. Sadly, it was the first and last time I'd ever heard those words out of his mouth. My young adulthood was a lot more of the same stuff, just with lots of cake. In that picture, I'm 285 pounds. I'm the guy all the way on the right. And that was my, my highest weight. I was probably three quarters to fully tracked at that moment. Because another thing I did is I got into marijuana and alcohol. Again, usually simultaneously. So leading up to my NDE, I was a person who felt like I wasn't good enough, I would never amount to anything, and that I was always wrong. No matter what I said, no matter what I thought, no matter what I felt, I was wrong. After 1990, I kept seeing the number 43. Whether it was in time, or a license plate, or the number on the side of a truck, that number kept coming to me. And eventually I figured it out. I've had several failed marriages, relationships, and businesses. Kind of what I think of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I was outwardly nice, polite, and humorous. No one knew the turmoil that was going on inside. And if you recognize yourself or somebody you know in any of this, I'm very happy for that. Because I think we've all gone through something that didn't feel quite right. I was self-loathing, bitter, lonely, rage piety just below the surface. I considered myself a professional drinker. I worked a lot, I drank a lot, <clears throat> I was competitive in sports, soccer, and I was passionate about sports. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, so we had the Baltimore Ravens. I was such a passionate fan that if we lost on Sunday, please do not talk to me until next Sunday. I could not look myself in the mirror. And this is challenging. You know, back, back in the day when I, I did have hair, it would come down and curl at the bottom. So I had to take a brush and turn it underneath. Hard to do that when you're not looking in the mirror, but I perfected it. I was always racing mine. What's the next thing? What, can I do? What job can I get? What business can I start? What can I do to survive? People kept coming up to me and telling me their life stories. I really didn't care. I was deathly afraid of dying, which goes back to my Roman Catholic upbringing because I was fairly certain of what the outcome would have been. But I did feel the call to service, and I joined the volunteer fire department, and I loved it. I was a firefighter, I was an EMT, um, I drove the ambulance. Um, it, it gave me a sense of purpose, a sense of giving back to other people. I could sense other people's emotions, and I noticed that they didn't often match the words that they were using. I would love people who would come up to me, oh, Tom, how nice to see you. And inside, I could hear, this guy's an idiot. I pursued being a DJ in a 
and a photographer. And at first you might think, well, those are really nice professions. I get to be around a lot of people, and that's very true. But as a DJ, I was in the booth. I didn't have to be out there. As a photographer, I could look at pictures, and I didn't have to be in them. And I struggled to find pictures of me during that period of time. In December of 2006, I was called an idiot by a friend of mine. We were arguing over global warming. He thought my position was uh, not acceptable to his uh, mind frame, and, and so he thought I was an idiot. A dear friend of mine ignored my birthday that year, and when she called three days later, four days later, she said she wasn't in a good enough place to call me, and I didn't find that acceptable. So I was mad, I was angry, I wrote out a New Year's resolution that I wouldn't let people to treat me like that anymore. In October of 2007, I took out my wedding ring because it said, to my best friend. I sat it on my dresser and I said, you're not even a friend. You're not my best friend. I quit drinking and I quit eating french fries and I promptly lost 100 pounds. And then I died. <laughs> February 27, 2008. The sun was shining, the sky was blue. Little did I realize I would end up in the ICU. I had done a five mile power walk. I went to the hot tub, went through the pool to get to the shower, tried to get dressed. For some unknown reason, that particular day, I put my pants on first. Normally I put on my shirt. And then I stood up to put my shirt on. Well, I tried to stand up. And I couldn't. I had to sit back down. And I talked to the people at the, at the gym where I was, and I asked them to get me some orange juice. I figured maybe my blood sugar was low. I hadn't eaten that much. I drank the, blood, the, the uh, orange juice. And then I, I couldn't sit up anymore. I had to lay down. And I knew something was wrong being an EMT. So I had to call the paramedic. I was very fortunate that during the paramedic's examination, one of the things they do is they hook up the uh, leads to the monitor on one side. If they don't like the results there, they move to the other side. And when he started moving the leads, I said, I know what's going on. Let's go to the hospital. To me, what's remarkable about that is there was no pain whatsoever. And I have watched cardiac patients, and I've seen the pain that they're in while we're treating them. So I, I didn't think I was having a heart attack. I didn't know what was happening. But when I saw that, I said, let's go. And fortunately, we were only five minutes away from the hospital. <laughs> this is where a little bit of medical knowledge and a whole lot of emotion can meet head on. It was not a pretty sight. They wheeled me into a room that was so small that I could stretch my arms out and I could touch the equipment on either side. The other scary part about that is I knew what the equipment was. And I kept hearing the monitor once they had me hooked up. I was familiar with the equipment. I just wasn't familiar with the guy being worked on. This was all new to me. But I knew that monitor was there. And in a way, that gave me some comfort, until it stopped. <laughs> the nurse leaned over in front of me and kept saying to me, Mr. Leach, would you please open your eyes? And it got frustrating because I was looking right at her. I was telling her she had blue eyes, she had a pink scrubs on, and I couldn't understand why she wasn't hearing me. As a photographer, angles are very important. A lot of times when I do portrait work, I want to be above my subject. So I was looking at her, and it ever so slightly started tilting until I was looking at her forehead. The next thing I remember, the heart monitor went monotone. And like I say here, when it's your own heart that is monitoring, it kind of changes your perspective on what's going on. 
At that moment, I knew that the demeanor in the room had changed from diagnostics to life saving. And that's My visual perspective kept changing, and I seemed to be floating further and further away. And it was a small room. I didn't have very far to go. And yet I was still seeing everything. I went into a darkness. And it's not just a blackness. To me, it was a void. I think Neil Donald Walsh does a, a good justice when he calls it no-thingness. The source of all knowledge, the void. At first, I just thought I was going to sleep. And my mind went back into its racing logical form. I was thinking things like, did I turn the water off? Did I have my keys? Had I called my mother? All of this, all at the same time. Like, <laughs> it started dawning on me that I wasn't in Kansas anymore. And I finally remember coming to the conclusion, I'm dead. Or at least what I understood death as being. Yeah, being raised Roman Catholic, I knew what was coming. St. Peter and I were going to have a meeting at the gates, and he was going to decide whether I was going to take the high road or the low road. And I was fairly certain I was not taking the high road. <laughs> Good news is, neither were any of my friends, so I'd have some company. <laughs> this is where it, it we talked a little earlier about having words to describe what happened. This is, this is where this starts coming into play. <clears throat> I remember seeing a light. I don't remember any sense of motion or changing in distance. All I knew is at one moment the light was out there, and the next, I was in it. I like to say, being surrounded by that light is like putting on a warm, fuzzy blanket and grabbing a slice of mom's cake. I didn't see anything in heaven other than my life review. But I could tell there were many, many folks around me, entities around me. And I did feel encouragement and love and support. And I smelled aqua velva, which was my dad. I felt a tail that kept wagging on my leg. That was my dog, the one that licked me on the face at the top of the stairs when I was younger. I felt my grandfather, he had the smile that beamed throughout the house. I felt that. I felt my grandmother's joy because she was seeing me again. Both of which had passed very early on. My dad died in 1990. Now I want you to remember, 1990, the number 43. I'll bring that back in a little bit. And my grandfather died in 91. My grandmother died when I was 15. So that would have been 1974. 75. Yeah, I wasn't in Kansas anymore. And that dawned on me at that moment. Up until this moment, I was still part in this world, thinking what I had to do, where we were going. Again, did I call my mom, which was always very important to me. But now I realized something was severely wrong, and the thought that I would never see my mother again finally hit me. Yet I knew I was in unconditional love. I had a total lack of fear. I felt completely joyful, even knowing that I was dead. And very, very peaceful. Just like eating a piece of mom's cake. This entity came to me and I can't say it was a voice, and I can't say it was music, but it was the most beautiful combination of the two. 
And my greeting was, welcome, blessed one. You are blessed. We are honored to have you here. We have no clue how honored we are on the other side of the bed. They treated me like I was a rock star. And if we did know how much different this world would be, if we knew, and this is why NDE years love to talk, and it's hard to shut us up, because we want everyone to know how joyful the experience is, especially when we go back permanent. The next thing that happened was my life review. Now, the first scene I saw, I fortunately have a picture of. This is my son, he was born in 1993. The scene that I saw in full HD, 360-degree surround sound, Dolby <laughs> stereo, was this scene, but I could smell the formula. I could feel his body. Whoops, I don't know what that was. Get the tech guy. Oh. I could feel his body moving in that blanket. And unfortunately, I could also smell his diaper. Some of the scenes were so joyful and so loving, and this is where my melodic friend would snuggle up to me, like an attaboy. You done good. Some of them were not so loving. And these were the ones that I saw through the other person's eyes. One in particular brought me to tears. I never thought I would cry in heaven. But I saw the room. I saw we were having a conversation on the phone. Um, I felt the emotions. And, and I, I'm not going to say I, I didn't do anything horrible. But I didn't do something nice to this young lady. And it affected her tremendously. And it brought me to tears. At that moment, my melodic friend put an arm or a wing, I describe it as a wing, around me and whispered in my ear, remember here you were learning. And it was at that moment that I realized we are not judged in heaven. Which, in the one hand, I was extremely grateful for, and on the other hand, I was ecstatic about because I wasn't going to take the low road after all. But it wasn't until that moment. And being Roman Catholic, I was used to being cracked over the head with the yardstick. And yes, they did do that. Remember those erasers for the chalkboards? <laughs> do you know how accurate those nuns could be? I mean, they could bounce a, one right, right off the top of your head. <laughs> and, and the worst part is you never got it all off. So when you went home, mom and dad knew that you had gotten hit with a razor by the nun, and the first question was, what did you do? <laughs> what, is, what did you do? <laughs> I knew that. I will say that we are too hard on ourselves. And especially with my background, now that you see a little bit about my background, I was really hard on myself. How many of us have done that in our lives about anything? You can't do this. You're not going to succeed at this. Your theory isn't correct. And that's not what's important over there. What's important is how we treat each other. We're here learning. And I've heard this all weekend so far, all week so far. In one form or another, this playground is where we've come to learn. 
And we've chosen the lessons that we want to learn here. And we've also heard that if we don't learn those lessons, they keep happening. <laughs> As the last scene faded, I can't say that they told me that I wasn't staying, but I got the, the distinct impression that I was not going to be there much longer. Um, I, I wasn't very happy. I was angry. I felt peace. I felt unconditional love. I felt home. And I like to capitalize that because this is a playground. I want to go home. Why would they ever think that I wanted to leave? <laughs> this is the second thing I never thought I would do in heaven. I argued with my angel. <laughs> And I've done this recently, too, where I'm standing and I've got my fist up and you are not sending me home. You are all proof that my argument was flawed. <laughs> when I left, I heard the words, remember to love almost in an echo kind of form, like they do on television or on the radio sometimes, you know. Remember to love, love, love. That's what I heard. It was almost as if they were kicking me out and saying, but it'll be okay. The next thing I know, I was in that dark void again. After a while, I figured out the dark had more to do with my eyes being closed than it did with coming through whatever that uh, happened to be uh, that we go through. I think Lee calls it the bardo. I knew I was back in my body. I heard the sounds of the machinery at some point. It was almost as if being a DJ, they faded it in. <laughs> I felt like there was a 70 pound weight on my leg. Come to find out they were right. It was there. What had happened was they did an emergency catheterization. I had two valves in my heart. One was 95% blocked, the other was 85%. So they fixed the one and told me I had to come back two weeks later to get the other one fixed. The next morning, I fought with the doctor, signed the release. I wanted to go home, and I knew somehow that I was strong enough to leave, and I was not going to stay. And I, I told the doctor uh, up here uh, just a few moments ago, he, he had suggested talking to somebody like me right after it happened. And I told him point blank, there was no way I was going to talk to him. Because I thought it was crazy. I knew what had happened, but it didn't make sense to me. I went back home, wasn't sure that it happened. I thought it was probably one of the best dreams I'd ever had. Logically, it made no sense, and it did not fit into my Catholic upbringing, or my negative mindset, or my worldview. None of it made sense. I was severely depressed like I had never been before. I cried heavily for 20 out of the 24 hours for three straight days. Now, as I reflect on it, I think I was crying because I wanted to go home. I didn't like the idea that they kicked me out. And my sanity was seriously in question, not like it hadn't been before. I could not share this with anyone, especially my wife at the time, which I've also recently found out is 
typical of folks who have an NDE experience. I heard something like 75% of NDE years who are in a committed relationship are not in that relationship in five years. I was divorced in 2012. Four years. I just made it in under the water. <laughs> It was at this point someone told me about Dr. Moody's book. I had never heard the term NDE. I had never heard about a tunnel. I had never heard about the light at the end of that tunnel. To me, a light at the end of the tunnel was either a car or a train, and I was probably in the wrong place at the wrong time. I read his book and I realized I may not be crazy after all. I told you earlier that my mind was constantly going, racing. I, I did a lot of different businesses, and like now, I would be working here, worried about that, and wondering what the next thing I was going to do, what I was going to do when I got home, what was planned for tomorrow. Oh, and by the way, next month I'm doing... Everything got quiet, and I started having actual individual thoughts. <laughs> Within a couple of weeks, I met Neil Donald Walsh. Now, I had read his books, and there was a book signing in Baltimore, uh, translate, Baltimore. Um, he was originally scheduled for a book signing there was an ice storm, they postponed it for a couple of days. So I go to see the book signing, and there was only six people there. So we had two hours, one-on-one, -on -one, with Neil Donald Walsh, who, in my personal opinion, is probably one of the most peaceful men I've ever met. And then I went back to work. In April of 2008, I met a man who used to own a hot dog cart in my hometown. I remembered him from being in high school. And I heard this still voice saying, this might be a good idea. Three weeks later, I opened WT Dogs on Main Street in Bel Air, Maryland. And I had a nice four-year run doing that. I was determined that no one would walk past me without me saying, hello, how are you? I didn't care if you bought anything from me. But you weren't getting away without a smile. It just, that became a passion of mine. I was touched and touched so many people that it gave me an almost home sense of joy. My empathic abilities took front and center. I now actually listen to people that told me their stories. And I actually cared. And I cried with them. I hugged them. Total strangers. I knew that something I said or did somewhere down the line was going to be helpful to them. And that gave me so much pleasure. I felt an unexpected connection to my town and others in that town. I later found out that my hometown was founded by my family. Up until this point, I did not know that. The courthouse that I stood in front of every day, my family sold to the county. And it was a picture of my great, 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 great grandfather in one of the offices, the Chief Justice's office. Cosmic 2 by 4 There have been a few along the way, if you hadn't noticed. While sweeping up around my cart one day, the town commissioner, town planner, or whatever, he came up to me and he said, do you know anybody who wouldn't mind sweeping the three block area around here? Which was code for Tom, would you do this for me? <laughs> and when he said $16 an hour, I said, sure. Even that was unexpected. Because I got the opportunity to meditate, exercise, and pray every morning. Because at 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning in a small town, of, I don't remember how many people we had, there wasn't anybody on the streets. 
I could hear the traffic lights changing. So I had a lot of time. Praying for me was talking to a saint who would say something to Jesus who might mention it to God who would eventually get back to me. That's my Roman Catholic upbringing. Being alone at that hour in the morning, I could talk to God directly. Now, we all know that's possible now. But back then, this was amazing. I started a dialogue. I started offering my opinions on things. When I got a particular thought correct, I got a quarter. And what I mean by that is that I'd be sweeping along the street, having my conversation with God, and here's a quarter. <laughs> now, we did have parking meters that did use quarters. But you didn't find quarters on the ledge of a building. And that's where they would be. They would be in unusual places. And always, only after I got something right. If I was close, I would get a dime. And I would literally look up to them, seriously? <laughs> One day, I had to have $100 by the end of the business day to renew a business license or to get a different business license. And I said to God, please, this is going so good. I don't want it to end. I need $100. I took three steps, and there's a crisp, brand new, $100 bill right at the bottom of my foot. I, uh, I didn't know <laughs> what to think after that. I know what that one was. <laughs> Previously, I would have marveled at the coincidence, but I knew there is no such thing. This was one of those gentle cosmic two by four says, here you go. I want to help you out. Plus you ask. You ask nicely. <laughs> Unfortunately, now I had to also learn to begin to love me. Which I had to eventually look in the mirror again. Now I want you to understand, when I say I didn't look in the mirror, I'm talking from about 1978 to 2008. I avoided looking in the mirror. If I needed to see whether my shirt was on right or my suit was on right, I asked my wife or my girlfriend or my mom. And of course, mom always said I looked good. So. <laughs> the fact that I now knew how much we are honored, loved, and respected on the other side helped me to start seeing myself in a different manner. The fact that they told me to remember to love, it dawned on me that the person that I needed to love the most was me. Very foreign concept. Take on it. I do apologize for that. Hopefully I can edit that out of there. I also noticed that I had more of an ability to be a conduit and to help people to heal, both energetically and spiritually, and eventually physically. I just knew stuff. I would have people come up and start a conversation with a subject I had no exposure to whatsoever, and I could hold an intelligent conversation with them. I don't know how. It was just there. I started to share some of what I had been thinking, but as of yet, I had not talked about what had happened to me. But I did talk about some of the things that awaited us. I talked about what I call my Big Bang Theory, and I'll give it to you really quickly, and it probably makes no physical sense whatsoever, but it means something to me. You know, we were told the, the Big Bang Theory, there was a singularity, it went boom, and all of a sudden we had the universe. And I got to thinking, what if that singularity was God? And if God 
blew up in such a fashion that formed the universe, that meant that every single cell in our body, in everything else, everywhere, was part God. Now, in Catholicism, I started looking for the lightning bolt. <laughs> but that's what I believed. I sought out the woman for my life review. I wanted to clear my conscience, and I wanted to accept responsibility for what I had done. It took me a while, but I found her. I found out that she had been so traumatized by that event that her entire life changed its direction. Fortunately, after having this conversation with her, she had gone back to school, finished her degree, and went to work for no such agency. Oh, I'm sorry, NSA, the National Security Agency. She is an interpreter of five different languages that she learned in five years. So when we talk about some of the effects that we have on other people and how it changes their lives, this became my anchor for that. And I could not be happier that we had this reconciliation. But I also couldn't be sadder that I caused it in the first place. I started practicing random acts of kindness, which is now a really popular phrase. The biggie for me, I no longer fear death. Kind of like jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, which I did once. And no, I will never do that again. <laughs> this is where it gets emotional, folks. That's my mom. And that's the little baby that you saw. That's my son, Ryan. In 1990, I promised my father I'd take care of my mother the best I could. And I did my darndest to do so. We were very close. We shared a lot of traits, especially stubbornness and a sense of humor. When my mom was passing, I asked her, Mom, how are you feeling? She said, with my hands. <laughs> That's how I'll always remember it. In October of 2010, I was led to express some of my deep emotions, and that's when mom started to get sick. In January 2011, she was hospitalized and had surgery that revealed she had ovarian cancer. The surgeon opened her up and said it looked like somebody had gone in with speckle all over her interior. The cancer was everywhere. So we closed her right back up. I was reading a book at that time, and in the book, um, there was a chapter that really touched me, and it gave me the ability to talk to my mom and say, it's okay, it's time to go. I will be okay. And I needed that push because I had a strong attachment to my mother. But there was nothing I could do to save her. I knew where she was going. And I was extremely happy for that. But I was sorry to see her go. And I still well up, as you see. Oh, there it is. I was scared out of my mind. Like I just said, I knew she, where she was going, but it still scared me. But I look back on my own experience. And I had some peace. And I tried to give her peace as she was heading out the door. On February the 20th of 2011, she crossed over. And I don't think she's left me alone since, but it's all another story. <laughs> Told you she had a sense of humor. Oh, the other thing my brother said to her, I'm going to go hop in the shower. And she said, I'd really like to see that. <laughs> she did have a sense of humor. During the service, a friend of mine agreed to play a flute that was specifically designed to play Amazing Grace. I think it's only about yay long. 
And during the whole service, my mom hated the song Amazing Grace. So, my friend, the flute kept going up. And I could see the look in the eyes. It was like, I don't know what's happening here. I knew. Later, we were at the house, and once the, you know, in, in our family, everybody comes over for free food and chit-chat and commiserate, and then they all leave, and that's when the pain really begins. And my dad picked that moment to let us know that he was there. And what it was, we had covered some chocolate cake in aluminum foil. And it wasn't near an air vent. It wasn't near anything that would cause it to move. No dogs were in the house. And yet, from the living room, I could hear the aluminum foil being moved. And I felt, and I knew, my dad was trying to get a piece of cake. <laughs> now, I see the numbers 29 and 43. 43, like I said, had been following me since 1990. That was my dad. The number 29 was my mom. My mom was born in 1929, and as a sports person, every team I played on, I tried to get the number 29 in honor of her. Recently, it came to me that the number, okay, I said that already. Um, here's the fun one. Mom was born in 1929. Mom and dad met in 1943. Hmm. And how I figured this out, I was watching the Star Wars movie at home, and I hit the pause button, and it stopped on 2943. <laughs> and I felt electricity all the way through my body, and goosebumps, and they're here now. I knew at that moment who 43 was. I hadn't known up until then. And of course I knew who 29 was. My mom hated to cook, so much so that she would tell you after she prepared the meal how bad it was. <coughs> Mother Maria is my aunt, who is a cloistered nun in Bethlehem, Connecticut. When she calls me and tells me that she had talked to my mom, a nun, talked to my mom, little paradigm shift there, told me she was wearing a purple dress, running around with a magic wand, bopping people on the head. <laughs> I knew that was my mom. And she was teaching other people how to cook. <laughs> And I already told you, learning about the town of Bel Air. Spirit began directing me toward a divorce, a relocation, and a new spiritual journey. I was divorced within four years. I moved to Virginia Beach. And I have since become a oneness blessing giver and an ordained minister in the order of Melchizedek. I was supposed to be a priest, remember? The day I got ordained, my mom let me know how proud she was of me. And that continues in this room today, this journey after having passed away. I want to reiterate, we come from unconditional love. There is no judgment other than what we judge for ourselves but yet we are harder on ourselves. I have such unconditional love for God and other people. And I put it in that order for a reason, folks. God, to me, to this point, was someone to be feared, how many times have you ever heard the fear of God? This is a God-fearing man. I don't, I, don't, I don't fear God anymore. God is a friend of mine. I talk to him all the time. 
It's when he talks back that I have issues. When we feel something passionately, when we cry, when we smile, when we grieve, when we laugh, these really are all expressions of love. Which is where we all came from. We talk about we are all one. I like to say everything we do touches someone, somewhere, somehow. Everything. I have a gratitude for the cosmic two by fours that have been pointing me in the right direction often that I didn't listen to. And I do have that closer relationship. I learned that I can love someone so much yet miss them just as much. There are lessons to be learned in grief as well as in love. And I've heard that several times today. And that makes me feel wonderful. Integration. <laughs> It's a lifelong process. Many stops, many starts along the way. You think you get it, and maybe not so much. Challenges prevent them, present themselves until you figure them out. Some of them can be very painful. And if you don't get it, they are hurting again the next time. And the next time, and the next time, in my case. I feel emotions more deeply than I ever did in my life. When I tell someone I love them, it comes from here. I like to say it comes from the top of my heart. When I cry, I cry harder than I've ever cried. When I'm happy to see you, that joy just comes all the way up through my toes, or from my toes. I've also had repeated cycles of depression. Part of it is because I want to go home. Or I don't recognize that people don't feel the same way that I do. And that's hard for me to figure out sometimes. I do have developed new ways of seeing our playground. Instead of being concerned about the turmoil over here, or over here, or the joy over there, I see it all as one big picture. One has to happen for the other. <laughs> Has it always been easy? Yeah. Have I forgotten some of the lessons I've learned along the way? Yeah, absolutely. And that's when the Cosmic 2 by 4 comes out again. And says, here, you need to remember this. I am not so secretly in desire to go home. Will I do something to bring that about? No. I described it to a friend of mine one time that if I was standing in a highway and a bus was barreling down on me, I'm not so sure I'd step out of the way. But I wouldn't jump in front of it. And I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it kind of does to me. There's nothing more to say than where we are headed is the most wonderful, joyful, peaceful, loving place we can ever be in. It is home sweet home. It is joy. It is love. But I also ask you to pay attention to the cosmic two by fours in your life. They will guide you in how to get there in a nice, peaceful manner. I hope you've enjoyed tonight and that we've touched someone's heart in the room. And I want you to remember to love. Love you, love your friends, love your neighbors. I will entertain some thoughts and questions and comments, but I'd rather go have some cake. <laughs> now, in doing this presentation, I finished up at 7.43. Oh, I love that. 
This is slide number 43. I didn't plan this. I didn't plan on stopping at 743. I stopped and I said, I'm done. I like the product. It's 743. So what is love? According to Merriam-Webster, love is a strong affection for another rising out of kinship or personal ties. It's an attraction based on sexual de desire, affection, and tenderness felt by others. An affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interests. A warm attachment, enthusiasm, or devotion. And my favorite, to hold dear, to cherish just like we're cherished on the other side. <coughs> love is a feeling of beautiful warmth one person can bring to your heart, and a feeling of loneliness deep down inside whenever you must be apart. Love is a feeling of gladness that comes from the sight of one happy smile, a feeling of comfort you have when you know there's somebody there all the while. Love is a feeling of such caring, a feeling of magic and fun, a feeling of wonderful oneness you share with only that certain one. And that's E.B. Michaels. This is a greeting card I was given in 1982 by a woman that I was supposed to marry, but that didn't work out. And one of the first things she says in this card to me personally, even though you don't think so, it's so easy to love you. I remember, obviously now I carry it with me all the time. I remember that. The Buddha says when you like a flower, you just pluck it. But when you love that flower, you water it daily. Love is the expansion of two natures in such a fashion that each include the other, and each is enriched by the other. And that's by Felix Adler. W.H. Auden said, among those whom I like or admire, I can find no common denominator. But among those I love, I can. They all make me laugh. <laughs> to love is to receive a glimpse of heaven. I would argue that not only is it a glimpse, but it is what it is all made of. What we are made of. Thank you, Karen Sunday. That's why love stories don't have endings. They don't have endings because love doesn't end. And that's from Richard Bach. And then something I'd like to consider one of the highest authorities uh, in writing, love. Avoid it if at all possible. <laughs> the hitchhiker's got the gals. That was um, we've talked a lot today about the electromagnet around the earth and, and around our heart. And our heart is the largest electromagnetic generator uh, in our body. And it's just like the earth field. It's expandable, and when we direct it, we can send it out, not only to our planet and our universe and everything else, but we can direct it toward individuals. And it's felt by those that we send it to. Proverbs 27, 19 says, As water reflects a man's face back to him, so is the heart of one man to another. This means when you are treated with love, your heart feels that love. The Dalai Lama says, ultimately, the reason why we love, or why love and compassion bring the greatest happiness, is simply that our nature cherishes them above all else. The, the need for love lies at the very foundation of human existence. It's where we come from. It's what we're trying to perfect while we're here. Many end the years report that they've been exposed to pure love to come back with that feeling etched in their hearts. I've heard that a lot. I feel it a lot. Love is where we come from. That's why we call it home. I found a Hindu teaching that says, for the thing which is everywhere is only love, and love is the only thing which is like a soul within us. Love is God. 
Love is an energy. It can neither be created nor destroyed. It just is and always will be. Giving meaning to life and direction to goodness, love will never die. And that's Bryce Courtney. And as you figured out, I have a little bit of a sense of humor. This is another one of my favorites. It comes from Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us. It penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. Thank you, Obi-Wan. And I think... Okay. Um, how do we express love? We express our love for the divine. We express our love for our planet and our environment. We express love for a geographical location, our county, our state, our city. We express our love for a cause, a hobby, or an activity. We love our family, our friends, our coworkers, our employers, our strangers, and our friends. We love our significant others. And we love ourselves, the hardest of them all. And I don't want to go into that portion of the workshop, but I do want to show you one last slide. Because I worked in the airline industry for a long time. And, oh, come on. There it is. I know you've all heard this if you've been on a plane. In the event of a decompression, an oxygen mask will automatically appear in front of you. If traveling with a child or someone who requires assistance, secure your mask on first and then assist the other person. We hear this in all kinds of different ways. You can't love someone until you love yourself. So I'm really going to leave you with this tonight. Self-love, to me, is the most important. Our biggest challenge in life is to love ourselves as much as God loves us. It's a tall order, because God loves us unconditionally. And I think that our striving to unconditionally love ourselves is the most important part of the journey. So with that, I'd like to entertain any thoughts, comments, suggestions, questions?